Good morning and welcome to everyone at DCF today. It's so great to be with you and to pre-record this message to share with you on this Saturday morning as we come to this third week of Lent and as we're preparing for the coming of the Lord and thinking also about his second coming uh, when he comes to to set things right. Let's begin with prayer. Father, we're grateful to you for your presence with us today. Thank you that you are for us and not against us. Lord, we thank you that you are with us, that you are Emmanuel with us in all of the joys and all of the challenges of life. We thank you that you are in us, Holy Spirit of God, to to create within us more and more the character, the love, the goodness of Jesus. And that you're also among us as we come together to worship and to praise you and to serve you together. Thank you that you are leading us together as your church, not just downtown Christian fellowship, but in the big picture, all of your people throughout the earth. We pray that you give us ears to hear your voice now as we think about your word and about Jesus, our joy today. In Jesus' name, amen. So one of the songs, one of the hymns you sang today is a carol that we're all very familiar with called Joy to the World. This is a great carol. It's a, the poem of it was written by Isaac Watts one of the greatest English hymn writers, and it was written just over 300 years ago, 301 years ago, in 1719. And this morning what I'd like to do is just think with you for a minute about some of the words of this song and, and some scriptures that kind of lie behind the words of the hymn. And so you have them laid out for you there on your handout today, on the back of your handout. And we're going to look at these verse by verse with these four verses of joy to the world. The first verse says, Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing. And that first line, joy to the world, the Lord is come. This, this hymn, this poem, was written speaking in a certain way about the first coming of Jesus there in Bethlehem all of those years ago. But it also refers to the next coming of Jesus, the second advent, his second coming to earth when he comes to take us as his own and to make things right and ushers in a new physical heaven and earth with us in it, his people in it, with bodies that have been renewed and restored and are immortal. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. On that first uh, Christmas morning, we have that account of all of, of the angel appearing to the shepherds and his news to them in Luke chapter 2 and verse 10 was, Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. And in this third week of Advent, we are thinking about joy and about the joy that we have in Jesus and through Jesus and because of him. Jesus is our joy. And so Isaac Watts writes, Joy to the world, because the Lord has come. And the angel said, I bring you great tidings which will be to all people, to all the world. The coming of Jesus was an event that would bring joy uh, wherever the gospel went, wherever it was proclaimed, wherever people heard the good news that their sins could be forgiven through Jesus Christ and that they could come into a new relationship with him 
a joyful and a love-filled and a grace-filled relationship. It was joy to the world when Jesus came that first time, and that, and that joy has continued and continues today in our hearts and in our minds and in our lives. I'm so grateful that even in this time of health challenges for me, that the joy of the Lord is my strength, as the scripture says in Nehemiah 8, 12. The joy of the Lord is our strength, and the joy comes because of what Christ has done for us and because of the reality of his presence in our lives. So, joy to the world, the Lord has come. Next line, let earth receive her king, let every heart prepare him room. And I thought as I was reading that about Psalm 24, where there's this uh, poetic picture, and we're familiar, some, many of us, with these words, where the psalm writer says, Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, lift up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room. We should open the doors, the gates of our heart as those ancient gates and welcome into our lives Jesus Christ, who is the king of glory, full of glory, glorious, mighty in battle. He is Yahweh, the one true God. And so we open our gates to him. Let every heart prepare him room, room for him to do his work of convicting us of sin and leading us to salvation, leading us to forgiveness of sins and to a day-to-day -day fellowship with him and relationship with him. And then that first verse ends, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing. And I'm thinking when I read those words about Romans chapter 8 and verses 20 and 21, where God is speaking about uh, nature. And he says that, that against its will, all of nature, all creation, was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. The, the coming of Jesus Christ is a day for heaven to sing as that those angel choirs were singing to the shepherds and through them to us, to all the world, uh, singing uh, glory be to God in the highest, praising him and joining with the angels, joining with heaven, nature itself, particularly on his second coming when he comes to set it free from the curse, nature will be singing and looking forward to being set free from the curse and from death and decay. What a wonderful thing that will be when death and decay are no more a part of the natural world because God will have restored things to, uh, in a way to as they were in the Garden of Eden. No more death, no more decay. Hallelujah. Verse 2 says, Joy to the world, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ, while fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy. Notice again the emphasis on joy. Joy to the world, the Savior reigns. And at this time we know that the reign of the Savior is only partial on this planet Earth, that wherever people bow the knee to him, that he is Lord and he reigns. But the day is coming on his second coming that he will rule and reign throughout the world. All, the, all of the knees in heaven and earth and under the earth will bow to him and every tongue will proclaim that he is Lord, that he reigns, the Savior reigns. And that will be a wonderful time of joy 
There's so much joy that God has for us even now in this life. Can you imagine what that will be like on that day when Jesus comes again? And the joy will be phenomenal, and he will reign fully over all of his creation here on planet Earth. Uh, it says, let men their songs employ, and we try to do that at Downtown Christian Fellowship to employ songs and hymns and spiritual songs there's so many psalms that relate to this. Psalm 47, verses 6 and 7. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our King. Sing praises, for God is the King of all the earth. Sing praises with understanding. Let us join in. Let men their songs employ. Let's sing those songs, even if our voices are not so great, Let's make a joyful noise. Let's sing praise to the Lord. It's a beautiful sound in God's ears to hear his, his children singing praise and thanksgiving to him for his great goodness. And it, the, that second verse says that let men their songs employ while fields and floods and rocks and hills and plains repeat the sounding joy. That's the picture that we have for the second coming of Christ. All of creation, all of the fields, all of the waters, all of the rocks and hills and plains will be echoing and repeating the joy of the angels and the joy of God's people as we welcome him as king of planet earth and king indeed of all of the whole world over all of his creation. Repeat the sounding joy. Verse 3 says, No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow, far as the curse is found. And uh, that's an interesting verse. It reminds us of what happened in Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve sinned, and there were curses that were proclaimed upon them and really on the whole earth itself. And I'm thinking here of Genesis 3, verses 17 and 18. Then to Adam God said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Then God says, Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life both thorns and thistles, it shall bring forth for you. There was a curse, really, of thorns and thistles. That thistles. And the songwriter here says, don't let thorns infest the ground anymore. Don't let sins grow. Don't let sorrow grow. With the second coming of Jesus and the full release of his joy, he comes to make his blessings flow as far as the curse is found. Any place that, that experienced a curse, anything that experienced a, uh, a, uh, an admonition of, of, uh, of difficulty from the Lord because of man's sin, all of that curse is done away with. He comes to make his blessings flow as far as the curse is found. You may feel that there are some places of cursing upon your own life places that are that you have been humbled, places that you struggle with, all of those places of curses, God gives us the grace and the strength to be delivered in this life, and the day will come when every blessing will flow and every curse on planet Earth will be broken as Jesus Christ takes his rightful place. Hallelujah. And then the fourth verse says, he rules the world with truth and grace. What a picture that will be at the end of times as he rules all of the world with truth and with grace, the full ruler of the new heaven and the new earth. And he makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and the wonders of his love. It will be a kingdom, an everlasting kingdom. It's already 
here in a certain sense, but it will be coming in its fullness on that day when Jesus returns. And it will be a, a glory of righteousness, and we will see the wonders of God's love revealed without restraint in all of their fullness on that future day, that second coming. So there is the first coming that we celebrate and we're grateful for uh, during this time of Advent and Christmas. And we think about it, we reflect on it, we ponder it, and we rejoice in that first coming and all that that has done, all of God, that God has given us because of Jesus Christ's first coming. We can't even hardly begin to imagine what at that second coming will be revealed in us and in all of God's creation. It will be wonderful, and I trust that you will be there. I have every plan and every expectation and every pursuit to be there myself on that day as God recreates us with immortality in mind and, and gives to us the glories of a recreated and beautiful an indestructible world. Thank God today. God bless you and help you and encourage you at this Christmas time. Thank you so much for your prayers. We're looking forward to continuing to be with you as we face the remainder of December and as we come into this new year of 2021. Father, thank you for each one who is with us today. And I pray your blessing on them, your strength on them, your goodness on them, your forgiveness for them, your deliverance for them. Father, help us to walk and to move and to grow in you day by day as we seek your face, as we read your word, as we pray, and as we experience your love and your goodness and your grace in our lives. Be exalted in us, we ask, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys.